time is an endless river of moments. The ebbs and flows of its waters can be very treacherous to negotiate. A great legacy may sometimes be a burden on those that come after. Today, we journey in time to an empire in troubled waters and the heavy shadows of its mighty past. Sakwato, capital of the Sakwato Caliphate, the largest state in sub-Saharan Africa, home to 10 million people. Beautiful, golden undulating sands of the Sahel, caressed by the sun's scorching embrace and cooled by the Hamatan winds. Today, the northeasterly winds bear more than a cold chill. There is a nervous restlessness about, and even the young ones are quiet. The city has been filling up with hundreds of people each day. These visitors exchange no cheerful pleasantries or warm embraces. The long, sullen looks of their parched faces, numbed and unfeeling from exposure to the elements. The light in their eyes, dim with pain. They were refugees fleeing war and bearing the news that all had feared the most, that Kano had fallen. It was difficult news to digest. Denial was far easier than contemplating the fact that Salkuto was now virtually isolated, with Kano, her strongest and richest emirate, vanquished. The people speak to one another in hushed tones, disbelief in their hearts. How could Kano have fallen that easily? The Pearl of the Caliphate, that mighty fortress with 40 feet walls, she had held out for less than a day. The Emir of Kano, Ali Baba was in Salkuta at the time of the fall, and he had with him the bulk of his elite cavalry. He must have known the enemy was coming for Kano soon. After all, he'd warmly given shelter to Magaji Kefi, Dan Yamusa, who had assassinated a British officer. Perhaps he had put his trust in the formidable walls of the city, and he was right to have done so. They impressively had withstood the pounding fire of four cannons, their shells bouncing off like mere pebbles. Unfortunately, one of the smaller and less well defended gates was breached. Alas, with the protection from the walls gone, the battle was quickly over. Sakin Aliyu, he hurriedly marched back home to retake his city at the head of 3,000 riders. These were the crack force of his army and they would stun his adversary with their speed and power and purge this invading stain from his land. The Emir had however underestimated his enemy, who had set up a very clever ambush at Kwatakwashi. His brave riders charged and charged again, but the enemy did not break. It was a most unequal encounter, and the Emir, realizing the futility of his situation, counted his losses and abandoned the battlefield leaving just under a thousand of his best men dead. It was a totally overwhelming defeat and Kano was truly and finally lost. One can only imagine the humiliation these men felt at losing the jewel of the caliphate, like having your bride stolen from you and then being beaten publicly in the market by the same man. Back in the capital of Salkwato, an emergency council of the most powerful men in the realm had gathered. The Caliph at Tahiru Muhammad, the Waziri who was the Grand Vizier or Prime Minister Bukhari, the Marafa Salkuto Maiturari, the Madoki, the Ubandona, Dan Magaji, all great men. Opinions were as different as the personalities present. The issue, you see, was much a political military one as it was theological. As such, any resolutions reached must be supported by legal and religious evidence. No decisions could therefore be taken lightly. Manuscripts from the founding fathers and precedents from all the Islamic kingdoms are dissected. It all boils down to three options. To flee, to fight, or to surrender. Marafa Maiturari, who was the caliph's brother, was in the camp of those advocating for a hijra or migration and the caliph himself seemed to favour this idea. Empty out the city and head for lands where they will never be subject to the rule of an unbeliever. Others, like the Madoki, 
who was the head of the cavalry, are vehemently opposed to this. It is argued, the duty of the defender of Islam is to stand up to the enemies of God and die for it should that be necessary, to defend their wives, children and their great capital. One cannot run away from duty, he says. How far will you run? How long will you run? The great Shehu, he quotes, said the kingdom is a reflection of its ruler. How can we truly be Muslims if our overlords be something else? Others counter that Shehu Dan Fodio, the founder of the Sokoto Caliphate, fled first before fighting and that the aim was to preserve the people and their holy way of life. They argue that the peoples of Nukwe, Bida, Adamawa and Naokano were brave and dutiful. They fought ever so bravely at the Battle of Bida which lasted three days, but the end always seemed inevitable and now Salkwater stood alone. Back and forth the arguments went, the Caliph himself would have the final decision. Rang Kadede, your majesty they ask, what is your counsel? Of everything that had been said that day, none rang truer than those words. Now we stand alone. Caliph at Tahiru Muhammad had been lost in thought. His mind had wandered to the stories of his great grandfather, the founder of the Caliphate, over a hundred years ago. Those were better times. He might have wondered why fate had bound his reign to these difficult days. His weary eyes stared into nothingness as he felt the weight of his great ancestors, mighty men of mighty deeds, Abu Bakr, Abdullahi, Muhammad Bello, and the first and greatest of them all, Uthman ibn Fudi, Uthman dan Fodio. A hundred years ago, the Sahel was a very different place. But then again, perhaps not too dissimilar. These were the days before a unified empire of emirates. The star of the preeminent power in those days, Kanem Bornu, was fading. And the Hausa Sarkins or kings of city-states ruled with absolute power. There were incessant squabbles as each tried to fill the power vacuum left in the wake of the weak and waning Bornu and Songhai empires, Gobi, Zamfara and Kanu had become prominent, each trying to dominate the lucrative trade routes across the deserts to the north and down south to the Atlantic slave ports. So they fought one another again and again, seeking territorial expansion, influence and slaves. And those who suffered most were the commoners. They suffered under the weight of the taxes, they lost their children to mindless wars, corruption was rife and the bureaucracy was rotten. It was into this world, in December 1754, that Uthman was born to Muhammad Fodio and Sayyidah Hawa. Muhammad Fodio was a Sufi of the Maliki school of Islam. Sufism in Islam is all about reflecting inwards, purifying one's soul and having a close relationship with God. There is also an emphasis on following a teacher or a sheikh to guide one along this path and there were often great scholars and poets. Uthman was schooled by his father Muhammad, but also by other famous sheikhs of his day, notably Jibril ibn Umar, a revered North African teacher. Uthman the boy grew into a conscientious and very learned man. He wrote several legal texts, poems, and was fond of philosophy, dialectics, urban geography, and social anthropology. At age 20, he began his career as a wandering preacher teaching mostly the peasants and the poor and anyone who would come to him. From town to town he went, making many disciples and forging deep and lasting bonds with these communities. Islam at this time was already very widespread in West Africa and was definitely the religion of the ruling class. In many cases, however, it was practiced in name only. The poor often mixed it with Afro-traditional practices and the rulers and gentry often used it only as a tool for forming alliances and trade links with other Muslim states across the Sahara. They still fought many wars and profited from the sale of fellow Muslim prisoners. They heavily taxed the already suffering peasants. Danfordio saw firsthand the effects of poverty and the yawning wealth gap. 
Uthman began to speak up against these injustices as he preached for a pure form of Islam. His followers found soccer in his teachings and as they educated themselves reading his essays on the duties and responsibilities of kings, they began to envision the possibility of a better world. There was hope again and more and more people began to throng to him as their sheikh. The Shehu, as he was affectionately known by his followers, began to attract the attention of the rulers of Gobir, one of the preeminent city-states, and he began teaching and pushing for reform to its receptive king, Sakin Bawa. On one famous occasion, Bawa invited the teachers in his land to a feast and distributed gifts to the teachers. Uthman refused and instead made the following requests to preach more freely for tax concessions to the poor, for the freeing of political prisoners, and respect and ending of persecution to anyone wearing a turban or a veil. Bawa, the Sakin Gobir, agreed to all these requests, and you can only imagine the acclaim and renown that this brought Shehu Uthman. He became the instructor to the king's nephew and heir, Yunfa. Now, it is important to note that pervasive at this time Perhaps due to the large scale injustices and suffering was the belief in the appearance of a Mahdi who was going to be a guided leader to restore justice and true religion just before the end of the world. Although many scholars including the Shehu himself questioned the doctrinal basis for such beliefs and outrightly denied that he was the Mahdi, this did not stop many of his followers from believing that he was the chosen one. The often quoted a hadith which states that, at the head of a hundred years, God will raise for his people someone who would renew their way of life. Also, Shehu Uthman frequently had visions and prophecies which only led even more people to ascribe more messianic attributes to him. That he rejected these claims only strengthened the convictions in the hearts of his disciples that he was the ever humble and modest Mahdi nothing he could do or say could possibly convince them otherwise. He now mostly lived in the town of Degel in Gobir, where he had amassed thousands of followers. The 1800s were about to begin and the air was heavy with expectation. By this time, the tolerant Sarkin Bawa had died and Gobir was ruled by Nafata, who had begun to view the growing movement with increasing suspicion. He had good reasons to as well, as Danfodius' movement had assumed characteristics of a state within a state. His community was being guided by his many writings and edicts, and these were not always in line with Gobi State's policies. Sakin Nafata was very alarmed to hear that the Shehu had begun to encourage his followers to arm themselves, and the relationship began to sour very quickly. <laughs> 